And because we have believed in him who is able, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Let's make this a, a, a course of praise and prayer. Surely the presence. Lord, simply asking, asking for grace, asking for guidance, and asking for your goodness to continue in our pathway. Amen. Lord, we need your presence. We need to know that you're there when we call upon you. We need to know that you care individually. And we know that you care because you have said that you've numbered the hairs upon our head. We know that you care because there's not a sparrow that falls from the sky that you're not aware of. How much more do you care for your children that you love? I pray that we, as we come into your presence and worship this morning in song, in fellowship, and in the message that your presence would be real and profound and meaningful. Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray for the anointing 
of the Holy Spirit to come fresh upon us. I pray for the illumination of the truth of the Word of God this morning. And I pray that our souls would be refreshed, that our hearts would be revived. And as we leave this place of worship, we might say, as the psalmist said, praise God, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lord, we pray for special needs today. I pray for Miss LaDonna. And her family that's lost a young 48-year-old niece this week. And the heartbreak that comes through sudden loss and a wife and a mother and a friend. And Lord, may your abounding grace be with that family in this time of darkness and sorrow. I pray for Scott and Janice Johnson as they travel home from Minnesota from the death of his mother this last week. You give them traveling mercies. Lord, there's so many burdens and so many concerns and so many so much heaviness on our hearts and lives today that again that we cast those burdens to the one who can do something, who's able. Amen. We just give praise and thanks. In Christ we pray, amen and amen. Amen.
this week. She had an obstruction in her throat and couldn't breathe and so forth. Very, very sad. And uh, again, our prayer and love for Ms. LaDonna and that family. And I also mentioned Scott and Janice Johnson are on the way back from Minnesota. Uh, his mother, they went to see his mother, got to see his mother before she passed away. She had a very aggressive form of lung cancer. And uh, they did get to see. We did something different this week. We took out an ad on Facebook. That is, we put our last Sunday services. Thousand people have viewed that service of last Sunday. The militia boy singing. The board wells. Amen. And of course the message. But that and <laughs> we had one The wonderful thing about you just delete it. And we delete it. Here's something else I thought was very dear. I had a personal email then from a young fellow that lives in Kenosha Farms, who's a student pastor in an area of church. And he happened to see that comment. And he said, Pastor, I just wanted to write you and let you know that uh, that that it was very negative, it was very ugly, and, and so forth like that. But that very negative, ugly, uh, and, and he was just encouraging me, and I said, Thank you. Criticism that's justified from somebody that I trust greatly, and then I, I do listen and pay attention. But I said, my motto and my mission statements for 50 years have been preach, pray, and plug away. Amen. And I said, that's what I'm going to continue to do. I don't want to get any stuff on you. But I just thought I'd share that little bit of information with you. We, we stepped out and we thought we're going to do something a little different this week as an outreach and uh, show more that we'll just put the service, our last Sunday service out there and uh, of course it was the ad we had to pay for it. I think mean, it cost us about $110 to reach 7,000 people. Uh, that's money well spent in the market. Amen. Yeah. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the good news of this week. I don't think there's been any bad news. Uh, if it is, don't tell me about it, would you? Thank my father. Amen. Uh, again, we've got a lot done. We ran this week. We were able to run a cable from the, the medium, uh, from our media booth out to the annex. So now we're going to be able to have uh, uh, Wi-Fi internet out in the annex and we've ordered an alarm to go on the freezer so now should there be any kind of, of a fluctuation of temperature where again we we're going to lose food because we have an internet connection now we, we will have an alarm on that freezer that will notify 10 people and I'm going to have 10 people on there to be notified so somebody you know that they'll be doing that. So we've already done a lot, Brother Jake. Initiative again is always doing upgrading our equipment and so forth, and I'm so, so tremendously grateful and thankful. <coughs> now, again, this week we have the 4th of July on Saturday, but that's also Food Bank Day.
do. So anybody that would come to help on Friday to, to unload the truck and so forth, that, that we will not have that on Friday because they got the truck on this past Friday. But of course it's limited. We can't get uh, bread and other things like that. So that, uh, we'll, that they will be having food bank this Saturday, July the 4th, from 10 to 11.30. A lady, I was I was here yesterday working. A lady came to us today. Food bank. I said, no, ma'am. It was last Saturday. It's going to be next Saturday. It's not today. Oh, I got mixed up. Okay, but uh, so anyway, next Saturday. Any of you, and we will need some volunteers. We're going to need help. So if you can come Saturday. Janet Ryder, uh, Miss Sandra went, no, no, Miss yes. Sandra went and picked Janet Ryder up over at Fort Lupton and brought her and she got to come get out, just to get out. What a, what a blessing. Any questions see Miss Bart? The end of this month, well, they're this not July yet, but it's going to be here in a couple of days. On, on July the 31st, Friday night, July the 31st, we're going to have a potluck and then Mark Bailey is going to be in concert at 6.30. So we're going to have a potluck dinner. And uh, we'll have it the fellas, we'll have it in the fireside room, and we'll probably have some tables outside and so forth, being in July. And then we'll come in here for that concert at at, uh, at 6.30. So that's an important date that you don't want to miss. Friday night, July the 31st. Our mysteries of the month of the trash to Brazil. Again. Our church has probably supported the trash uh, close to 40 years. Uh, they've been on a missionary family. And uh, they're just what I would call faithful and steadfast uh, in, in Brazil in their missions work. They're not a flashy uh, type, but they're just faithful and steadfast. And I appreciate Stephen and Marilyn Trash missionaries to proceed. I believe that's all of our announcements. I believe at this time Miss Linda is going to sing. Linda
Thank you, Ms. Lisa. Excellent job playing there. All right, take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. I want to speak on how to stay up in a downtown. Or, I would title this message, Too Blessed to be Stressed. Amen. Too Blessed to be Stressed. Take either one of those titles. I love them both, and that's why I use them both. How to stay up in the downtime. Psalm 37. Stand with me as I read the first nine verses. Again, I'm reading from the New King James. The first nine verses of Psalm 37. This is a Psalm of David. Do not fret the cause of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. Dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Father, thank you again that you've given us a message of hope in days of darkness and days of despair. I pray that you might use the words of the psalmist David, inspired from the very heart of God, to encourage and strengthen us on how to stay up in down times. Speak to our hearts. In Christ I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Without question, anybody who's been paying attention to what is going on in our world today has plenty of reasons to fret. We are living in fretful times. Not just a pandemic, but again, we're living at a time when our history is being pirated and taken away from us. I agree with you. Amen. Amen. And to me, it's very troubling to see again all of these things that, that again, uh, are, are happening around us. The Lord willing, next Sunday, I'm going to speak for the July weekend if the foundations be destroyed. What shall the righteous do? And I feel like many of our foundations are being destroyed and our history is trying to be rewritten. Our country is being hijacked. Amen. By, Amen. Again, a socialist movement. And, and again, uh, Christianity is, is again being, it, 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 if the election goes as the polls say, we're, we're in big trouble as far as, as, as religion is concerned. In my opinion, uh, that's my opinion. But even, <laughs> even if you're not fretful about what's going on in the world, you should be. You, we all fret about our families. 
We all fret with friends who are going through some extreme situations. We all fret about jobs, and fret about checkbooks, and certainly, 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 we fret about our health. Now, everybody gets fretful at times. But God wants us to stay up in those down times. Amen. And in Psalm 37 especially, God shows us how to stay up in down times. Now, here we have a command. We talk about the thou shalt not in the Bible. The command. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. And yet here is a command. A command in verse 1 that says, Do not fret. Matter of fact, that command is reiterated three times in these nine verses that I just read. Amen. You saw it in verse 1. I just mentioned it. Do not fret. You see it used again down in verse 7 in the middle. Do not fret. And you see it the third time mentioned in verse 8 middle. Do not fret. And then he tells us do you see the last part of verse 8? Do not fret. It only causes harm. Now, we, we know that the word fret is about worry. And, and again, he, he's saying this is, this is what we should not do. We should not worry. We should not fret. You see, when the stock market goes down, people fret when their blood pressure goes up. The educated fret because they know too much. The poor fret because they don't have any money. The rich fret because they're afraid they're going to lose their money. The old fret because they're facing death. The young fret because they're facing an unsure future. And God says, do not fret. Now remember Jesus reiterated this very command of this very thought in the great sermon on the mount the greatest sermon ever preached Jesus preached in Matthew chapter 5 chapter 6 and chapter 7 and Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, let me read what Jesus said. Jesus said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat that reign? Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather the barge, and your heavenly Father feed them. Are ye not much better than they. Which of you by taking thought can add what cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought? Or why, why, do you, why do you worry about your raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil about him into the spin. Yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore if God now this is our Lord speaking. Wherefore if God, that's our Heavenly Father. Wherefore if God, he says in verse 30, if, wherefore if God so clothed the grass of the field which is today, which, it, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, the old ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, wherefore shall we be clothed? For all of these things do the Gentiles, the Gentiles is a term they used of the unsaved, for the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father, 
For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought, and don't worry <coughs> about tomorrow. For, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself sufficient unto the day. Now this Jesus is telling us three things there about worry in that passage of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is telling you, he's telling me, that worry is useless. useless. <coughs> you can worry, 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 but it can't, it's not going to change anything. Yeah. It, you know, he said you can't add one cubit to your stature. You're 5'5", five, five, but you want to be 6'3". So you're worried about your stature. The word is not going to add one inch to your stature. It's useless. Not only does Jesus tell us that worry is useless, but he also says it's harmful. Worry will do something to you that sand does to machinery. Put sand in machinery and see what happens. It comes to a grinding halt. And the same thing is true. Worry is harmful. It takes all the blue out of the sky. It takes all the joy out of your heart. Have you ever thought about what worry does to you? There's, a, there's very few forms of indulgence that we do that is more harming and draining than worry. <laughs> But not only is worry useless and not only is worry harmful, Jesus said. But Jesus says worry harms others. I mean, people who worry often are people who go around spreading gloom and doom. They're the kind of people who lighten up a room when they leave. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, they're a form of contamination. You don't dare ask them how are they doing because they're going to let you, they're going to give you an earful of how bad they have it, how bad things are. And, 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 and so worry not only is useless and harmful to us, but it harms others. Have you ever thought about how harmful worry is to God, our Heavenly Father. And Jesus said in Matthew 6 about how our Heavenly Father loves us and cares for us. When my children were little, or they were once, a long time ago, when my children were little, and I came home, and I saw them kind of clustered in the corner, and I said, children, what's wrong? But Daddy, are we going to have anything to eat? Well, of course you are. Daddy, are we going to have any clothes, new clothes to wear for school? Well, of course you are. Daddy, are we going to have a home to live in? Of course you are. If my children doubted that I loved them and I was concerned about them and that, that again, that, 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 that I wasn't going to provide for them and if I wasn't going to protect them, wouldn't that be heartbreaking to me as a father? Of course it would. But think how we insult our Heavenly Father by saying to our Heavenly Father, Father, you're not able to take care of me. Father, you're not able to watch over me. Father, you're not able to feed me. Father, you're not able to work out again those situations that I am facing. Worry is saying to God, you are not able. You're not able to provide for me. David, the shepherd of Israel, the man after God's own heart, again is writing the 37th Psalm. And he begins by saying, do not 
fret. Now, we know that probably David is in his older years of his life. He's not young now, but he's probably an old gentleman. How do we know that? Look down in verse 23 of this 37th Psalm. David says in this 37th Psalm in verse 23, as he talks about again his own personal testimony, he says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. And though he fall, he shall not utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. And then David says in verse 25, I have been young, but not now. Now, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. So David now is probably in the upper years of his life, like many of us are. And he said, you know what? There's one thing I can testify to. That is that God is always faithful. God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his people, his children. And he says that God will guide our steps and God will take care of us. I am, I was once young, but now I'm old. And you know what I have learned? He said, I've learned that God will take care of his children. So he says, I've not seen the righteous forsaken. And I've not seen his seed begging for bread. Because God is the great provider. Now here we come to Psalm 37. And here in Psalm 37, in these first nine verses, we have a recipe and the power of how to stay up in down times. He begins with the negative command, fret not. And then he gives to us four positive commands to follow on how to stay up in down times. The first thing he tells us of how to stay up in down times is this, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. What is he telling us? He's saying to you, brothers and sisters, trust in the Lord when resources vanish. Our resources are vanishing. And we throw our hands up and say, oh God, why? He says, listen, rather than fret, rather than worry, rather than wring our hands and whine, he says, trust in the Lord. That word trust is a rather interesting Hebrew word. It literally has its root in the idea of being face down on the ground with no visible means of support. <coughs> they were saying sometimes God puts <coughs> us in a place where we don't have any options. The only thing we can do is truly trust God. Now that's what God did to Israel. God brought Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. He did it divinely and miraculously by the shed blood of the lamb on the doorpost. The children of Israel have been set free and they're on their journey to the promised land. But all of a sudden, they come to a barricade. And the barricade was the Red Sea. There were mountains on each side of them and the Red Sea before them and the glittering swords of Pharaoh's army behind them. What are we going to do? They cried to Moses. Now I love the words of Moses when he said, when Moses said to the children of Israel, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
they had to trust the Lord when their own resources had vanished. And when they trusted God with their resources with God, all of a sudden the Red Sea parted. There was a four-lane highway all the way across the Red Sea. The Apostle Paul speaks of the very same thing. In the book of Philippians, Paul is imprisoned in Rome. He assumes probably he has a death sentence. He writes to the Philippian church, a church that he helped found it, that loved and cared deeply for. And Paul writes to the church of Philippi with these words found in Philippians chapter 3. Verse 11 and 12, he says, Not, not that I speak in respect of what. For well, I've learned that whatsoever state I am in, therefore to be content. He says, For I have learned how to be abased and how to abound. He says, everywhere in all things, I'm instructed to be both full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. He said, listen, this is what I've learned. I've learned to trust in the Lord, even when your resources are vanishing. Rather than fretting, when you are, when, when, when we, we are down, how to be up when we're down is we, we trust in the Lord. And then Paul said in the 13th verse of chapter 3, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I mean, he didn't get that kind of a trust out of some book. He didn't go to some conference and learn that. He didn't hear some preacher on the TV talking about that. You know how he learned that I can do all things through Christ the Spirit? He learned that by experience. He said, I trust in the Lord, even when my resources vanish, and I know that God can provide for me. Rather than praying, he said, I'm going to trust in the Lord. Amen. There are many times, beloved, when we cannot trace God's hand. It seems so confusing. It seems so difficult. It seems so out of character. We cannot trust God's, we cannot trace God's hand. And so we, why, why, why? I can't trace God's hand. I don't see all of this making sense. But we, when we cannot trace God's hand, we can trust. God's heart. That's why Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says the just shall live by faith. We live a life of faith. How to stay up uh, when in, in down times is we begin by trusting in the Lord when our resources are gone. <laughs> And notice the last part of verse 3 quickly. What does he say? Trust in the Lord. What? And do what? Do good. Do good. This is simple. That, that, that God simply commands us not to trust but to do good. Which, which again, when we, when we do good, we're, we're doing something positive rather than something negative. Charles Spurgeon called the Prince of Preachers, said this, True faith is actively obedient. Doing good is a fine remedy for fretting. There is joy in holy activity, which drives away the rust of discontent. And then the last part of verse 3, did you notice that? The last part, he says, and feed on what? His faithfulness. 
I just spoke three, two messages from Lamentations chapter 3. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. That God is truly faithful. That God will not fail us. And Jeremiah, though he was brokenhearted and in despair, when he began to ponder and think, Jeremiah said in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 and verse 23, Though the, uh, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm saying to you, brother and sister, if you want to stay up in down times, you've got to trust the Lord. Secondly, how do we stay up in down times is we delight in the Lord when dreams dissolve. Now look at verse 4. Rather than fretting, do not fret. It says, trust the Lord. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight in the Lord when dreams dissolve. Commentator John Gill explained that you should delight yourself in the person of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, Delight yourself in the perfections of God, His power, goodness, and faithfulness, wisdom, love, grace, and mercy. Delight yourself in His word, His gospel, in His worship, and His people. And delight yourself in the works of creation, providence, and redemption. I like what Pastor James Merit says about this fourth verse of delight in the Lord. Pastor James Merritt says the word delight literally means to take pleasure in. Nothing, nothing or no one should give you more pleasure than God Himself. Nothing should take priority over your first relationship to God. It's more important than your relationship to your spouse is more important, than your relationship to your children is more important than your relationship to your business. It's more important than your relationship to anything or anybody. As a matter of fact, the better your relationship is with God, the better it will be with other people. Now here's a principle when he says delight. How to stay up in, in down times, how to be blessed uh, again to be too blessed to be stressed is when you want what God wants delight yourself in the Lord when you want what God wants God will always give you more than you want Amen. let me say that again that is so important when you want what God wants delight yourself in the Lord when you want what God wants God will always give you more than you want. Some people have this erroneous idea in verse 4, if I delight myself in the Lord, that, that God will give me everything I ever want. No. But God will take care of our needs and watch over us. Now, if you delight yourself in finances, your finances can be threatened. If you delight yourself in our families, which we love so dearly, but again, things, situations can happen. Many times we kiss our loved ones goodbye. Circumstances change. It's only when our desire is totally wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ that we're going to find the innermost need of man. So again, some people just read verse 4. They get the idea, you know, if I love God, I'll have whatever I want. No. If you love God, you've got all that you want. That's what it says, to like yourself in the Lord. And you'll have all the desires of your heart, which is the Lord, your innermost need. 
poor Tim Bloom, who was again a prisoner of the Nazis and a, and a, a devout Christian, poor Tim Bloom said this, look around, you'll be distressed. Look within, you'll be depressed. Look to the Lord, you'll be at rest. Delight Amen. yourself in the Lord. <coughs> and so, how to stay up in, 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 in down times is we trust the Lord, we delight ourselves in the Lord. And thirdly, he says, commit your way to the Lord when your lifestyle is threatened. Commit your way to the Lord when your lifestyle is threatened. Notice verse 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him. And He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the new day. That word commit literally means to roll onto. The idea here is that when we commit something, we're rolling on to the Lord. Again, those burdens, those weights that we carry that drag us down rather than lifting us up. So he says, commit your way to the Lord, even when your lifestyle is threatened. The Lord does not want you, the Lord does not want me, the Lord does not want us to carry our burdens alone. So, he tells us to cast our cares and burdens upon him. Matthew 11, 28, Come and all you labor, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares about you. Now, we all have to admit that our lifestyle has have changed since the pandemic began in March. Our lifestyle has changed. And I, I'm beginning to wonder, and I have reservations, that we'll never go back to what we call normal when we began this year of 2020. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But I see just a little telltale signs that are telling me that we may not ever go back to normal. And again, I don't know about you, but there's not much joy in, in doing a lot of things that I used to do that I enjoy. I, mean, I used to love to go into Home Depot and just walk around Home Depot. Yeah. See all the things I don't need. <laughs> Amen. And all the projects that Jewel would like for me to do. <laughs> But I don't want to go in there now. I don't, even want, I, don't, I don't want to go through the door. I mean, unless it's, I absolutely have to. I mean, there's no joy in that. So it says, you know, when, when we're, when, 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 again, our lifestyle is threatened. We went to eat at the restaurant Friday night. You're scared to walk in the door. How do you walk in the door? You wear a mask in the door. Yeah. You take it off, you know, and so on. But after I've gone through all of that, I'm going into a restaurant to sit down and be served and eat. I, I've already had carry out for three months. That's, that's enough of that. And they've got plastic silverware with a little plastic bag for me to eat off for my, my dinner. Oh, good gracious. I want a fork that doesn't break. I want a knife that cuts. I mean, you know, again, just a little thing. Amen. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, I thought I was going to sit down. So, again, what is he telling us? How to stay up in a downtime is we've got to commit our ways to the Lord. Even when our lifestyles are threatened. And our lifestyle is threatened. We, we don't get to do what we once did, just in normal ways. And so he's telling us here that that uh, that we're to commit, that we're to roll on to. 
Now, let me illustrate how I roll on to back to the Let's say you had $50,000 in your pocket in cold cash. You'd sold an item. You would pay $50,000 in cold cash. You've got it in your pocket. Now, are you going to walk around with $50,000 in your pocket? I don't think so. What? You could lose it. You could get mugged. So what do you do? You take that $50,000. You walk into the bank. You get a deposit slip, you fill out a deposit slip, $50,000, and you give that $50,000 what? To the teller at the bank. Now, if you didn't think that teller or the bank was capable of taking care of your $50,000, you wouldn't take it there in the first place. What have you done? You committed something that was important to you and valuable to you. You've committed it to that bank. But it still belongs to you. It steals yours. All you have to do is write a check on it. All you can do is go make a withdrawal if you want to any time. You see, God wants us to commit to Him. He wants us to deposit those burdens that we bear rather than fretting, rather than worrying, fret not. He says, just commit. Make a deposit. Rule on to again the one who is able. And, 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 and that's why you and I should not necessarily be, we should be, I, I'm concerned. I've already expressed my concern, but I'm not worried. Amen. I'm not fretting. I know that God is in control. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm concerned. And concern should be a natural reaction of all of us. We should have concern. But when we're worried to the point that again we're almost to, to, to sick, then, then again, that's where it goes wrong. Now, to stay up in downtown, he says, trust the Lord, delight yourself in the Lord, commit your with the Lord. And lastly, he tells us in verse 7 and 8, or 7 through 9, to rest in the Lord when God seems slow to act. Rest in the Lord when God seems slow to act. And again, that's where we, we, we want God to come and do something right now. But God doesn't work on our time frame. Notice what the psalmist said, verse 7. Rest in the Lord and as we rest. Wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off for those who wait on the Lord. They shall inherit the earth. Now the word rest again in verse 7, rest in the Lord means also be still or silent. The, the NIV, the New International Version, uses the word still in verse 7. Be still. That word is used also uh, in, in Psalm, I believe it's 42. So, the, to rest means to be still. Literally, be silent before the Lord. You know what that means when we say rest of the Lord or be silent? It means... Do not murmur. Rest in the Lord. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Whatever it is, commit it to Him. Commit it to Him. Why? Because that's the solution. When we commit it to Him, we, we, we again and, and, and rest and, and are still in Him. The, the, we, 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 can, we, can, we can be blessed rather than stressed. Two friends were talking one day, and one friend said to the other, I'm upset! The other man says, well, why? Why are you so upset? He said, I'm upset because I'm in a hurry, and God is not. <laughs> that is so true. 
we have to wait patiently. And notice, he tells us there, rest the Lord, what? And wait patiently. You see, the beloved, one of the reasons that I am an optimist, even when we're in down times, one of the reasons that I'm an optimist is that I believe that I serve a God who is in control. Amen. I believe the God that I serve is a sovereign God who works through providence of events. You think about the early church. The early church not only survived, but it thrived. During, again, a time of intense persecution, when Caesar controlled the Roman Empire, and Christians were looked upon as a sport to be thrown to the lions as the people enjoyed the show. Christians were burned at the stake to light the pathway. And if they, again, did not denounce their faith in Christ. But you take 120 believers on the day of Pentecost, or, and, and, the, and the day of Pentecost came, and all of a sudden there was a conversion. You know why the early church thrived? Because the early church rested in the Lord. Amen. They rested in Him. And they wait patiently for Him. And they did not fret. Though we're living in somewhat of a downtime right now, we need to stay up. We sang a few moments ago a great hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We sang a few moments ago. It was written by a lady whose name was Louisa Stead. She was a faithful missionary to Africa from 1880 to 1915. Around the time she left for Africa, she lost tragically her husband. She watched him drowned off of the shore of Long Island, New York, as he had swam out to save a couple of young boys that were swimming. And he himself drowned, tragically. And she watched her husband drown. But rather than sulk and fret and become bitter, she wrote the words of that hymn, number 542. We sang it a few moments ago. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust <coughs> him more. If we're going to stay up in down times, if we're going to be too blessed to be stressed, it begins with not fretting and worrying. And then we trust in the Lord, and we delight in the Lord, and put our way to the Lord, and do rest be still. By the way, look at verse 8. He says, seek for angry, forsake wrath. We must be careful about being bitter. When days turn difficult, when days turn dark, we must be careful about getting angry, angry at God, angry at one another angry at our country, angry at this or that. He says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, dear one, may our hope be in Amen. David said, you know, I was young. Now I'm old. But you know what? I believe that God will take care of his children. Amen. Amen. God, who holds us in the hollow of his hand, will be there all along our pathway. Because he said in verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I want the Lord to order my steps as we go down this pathway of today and tomorrow. Who knows where? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father. Help us to trust, to delight, to commit, to rest. Lord, to know that. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. That you love your children just like we love our children. And we're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And you'll watch over. Lord, if there be one today that's never made that commitment to trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. If they've not said, Lord, I rely that I'm a sinner and I need Jesus as my Savior. Oh, Spirit of the living God, speak to that heart. Whether it's here in this building today or whether it's out on the internet through Facebook, Lord, that the one that's never said, I'm, 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 not, I'm fretting and I'm worried and I don't know what's going to happen. And I want to take the one who brings hope and love and life. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call, in the name of the Lord shall we say. May the Spirit of God minister to our hearts in Christ. I pray, amen. 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 Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, Brother Terry. Page 155. Page 155. Have thine own way.